Hey guys, Kid Aikino here, finally getting this video out, what, five, six months after I originally said I was going to do it? Well, better late than never, I suppose. So, as I'm writing this, we've just emerged from Godzilla King of the Monsters opening weekend. There's plenty of talk about the box office, it fell short of projections but still took the top spot, but even more about the critical response. Now, I'm generally not one to obsess over numbers, whether in terms of box office or the tomato meter, which is honestly fairly opaque, more than a little misleading, and overall not very informative or useful. What is surprising to me, though, after the reasonable critical reception of the 2014 Godzilla film and Shin Godzilla, is how harsh a lot of reviews have been. Love it or hate it, a lot of King of the Monsters reviews have been brutal not only panning the film, but summarily dismissing the entire genre. Some of these reviews, of course, beg the question of whether many critics saw the same film we did, or how they ever got to be paid to write about movies, but the bigger conversation I've seen rising from the discourse among fans and critics is about the role of the human story in a Godzilla film. A common point of dissatisfaction among King of the Monsters critics is its human cast and the plot stringing together the monster scenes. I found the plot perfectly adequate, if a bit overstuffed with ideas, and I felt the human characters were a huge improvement on the 2014 film, which kills one of its three interesting characters a third of the way in, and sidelines the other two in favor of a G.I. Joe. Bafflingly though, and a bit worryingly, one of the most common responses to such criticism is to ask who the hell watches a Godzilla movie for the plot or characters when the point is obviously the monsters. I won't argue with the fact that the plot and characters of King of the Monsters are mainly there to get us to the monster scenes, or even that there's inherently anything wrong with that, but there are a couple problems with that blanket statement. One, it more or less concedes a highly arguable point about King of the Monsters for no good reason. Two, more importantly, in what I can only assume is a rapturous fit of anti-intellectualism, it needlessly confirms the common prejudice against Godzilla and kaiju films in general that maintains that they're basically mindless spectacle in which looking for anything worthwhile in the way of story, characters, or substance in general is at best missing the point and at worst wrong. This accomplishes less than nothing, and yet there are people who think it constitutes a defense. As frustrating as it is to see self-described Godzilla fans misguidedly reiterate the same argument critics have used to dismiss the series for decades, I'm honestly kinda glad the whole discussion is happening, because it finally gives me an angle from which to approach Godzilla against Mechagodzilla beyond, I really like this movie. You might remember times I've mentioned previously that this is my favorite film in the entire series, and while I did like King of the Monsters, it hasn't changed that. I don't necessarily think it's the best film in the series, but when I first saw it in junior high, its human story really grabbed me in a way I wasn't expecting, and it's been my personal favorite ever since. It's also, conveniently enough, one of three Godzilla films directed by Masaki Tezuka released from 2001 to 2003 that share a number of story elements, making it a great illustration of how a solid human story can elevate any film, even one whose principal draw is watching giant monsters fight each other. Now, I don't want to sell that aspect of the film short. The monster stuff is good, of course. Kiryu, this film's Mechagodzilla, looks great. Godzilla looks okay, the miniatures are excellent, and the final battle has some terrific action. But that stuff alone isn't at all unique to this film. As I've said before, Tokyo SOS has more monsters and better effects overall, particularly improving on against Mechagodzilla's dodgy CGI. But as a film, I just don't like it as much. That said though, mediocre monster action certainly doesn't do Godzilla vs. Mechagirus any favors. The point is, though, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla is absolutely still worth watching if you're mainly interested in the monster battles. I would also be remiss if I didn't highlight the film's excellent score. All three of the Tezuka Godzilla films feature music by the series' first female composer, Michiru Oshima. All three of her scores are outstanding, but Godzilla against Mechagodzilla is unique among them in that it's the only one that consists entirely of her original compositions and it was actually recorded by the Moscow Symphony Orchestra, lending it an utterly massive sound. 
In the end though, like I said, what really did it for me was the human story, so let's take a look at what's going on there. After the death of the first Godzilla in 1954, and a series of other monster attacks in the intervening decades, a new Godzilla emerges in 1999 and rampages through Tateyama. Among the military personnel who respond to his emergence is Akane Yashiro, a Mazer Cannon operator. During a hasty retreat, Akane fails to notice an oncoming jeep as she turns her Mazer tank around, accidentally sending it tumbling down into Godzilla's path. While she's not officially held accountable for the resulting deaths, she nonetheless blames herself and is transferred to a desk job. Meanwhile, the Japanese government recruits Dr. Tokumitsu Yuhara, a biologist preserving endangered and extinct animals in biorobotic form, to construct an anti-Godzilla superweapon from the newly discovered skeleton of the original Godzilla using similar methods. His daughter Sarah encourages him to take the assignment, but privately questions the decision to resurrect Godzilla instead of her late mother, who died due to complications during pregnancy. Four years later, in 2003, the anti-Godzilla bio-robot christened Kiryu is finally complete. Akane's former commanding officer, feeling Akane deserves a second chance, selects her as the pilot. Dr. Yuhara immediately takes a liking to her, but she's quickly targeted by a crew member named Hayama, whose brother was among those killed in the accident in 1999. Despite her commanding officer's support, she becomes alienated from the rest of the team and remains quiet and withdrawn. The rest of the film, aside from the A-plot concerning Godzilla's attacks and battles with Kiryu, follows Akane's struggle with her guilt over the accident and with Hayama, Dr. Yuhara's somewhat clumsy attempts to rebuild a family both by balancing his duties on Kiryu's staff with trying to be a good father to Sarah, and by trying to initiate a relationship with Akane, and finally the lingering effects of Sarah's grief over the loss of her mother and unborn sibling. These arcs occupy the bulk of the film in between action sequences, and the ways they tie into not only the core Kiryu and Godzilla plot, but into each other, makes for one of the strongest human stories in the entire series. Let's dig deeper into Akane's arc first. Like a lot of Godzilla movies, this one has a very strong supporting cast, and could arguably be considered an ensemble piece, but Akane's central role in the action sets her apart somewhat as a singular primary protagonist. Akane's main goal in terms of the plot is redeeming herself by defeating Godzilla, but her personal arc goes much deeper. She has to learn to believe in and value herself and her own life if she's really going to heal. The use of these kinds of parallel related arcs when writing a protagonist is something that came up repeatedly in the screenwriting and story development classes I've taken. Stories about outlandish and novel situations are interesting, but throwing a character into the middle of one doesn't necessarily make us identify with them or want to root for them. A battle against Godzilla is exciting, but it's not terribly relatable. The secondary arc solves that by adding a simpler, more personal, and more universal struggle that ties into the main plot in some way. Usually some kind of internal struggle or flaw that prevents the protagonist from achieving their primary plot-related goal. Therefore, resolving the internal conflict or overcoming that flaw allows the protagonist to achieve their primary goal. This establishes a stronger audience connection with the protagonist by presenting them with a problem that the audience does understand, and makes their victory in the less relatable struggle more satisfying to the audience, which now better understands the work it took to accomplish that victory. It's a good way of making that victory feel earned. This technique was emphasized so much in my education because it's a simple and effective way to make a story more compelling, but like the three-act structure those classes also focused on, it's not the only way to tell a story, and especially shouldn't be taken for granted in fiction not created in the West. It's a very Hollywood, very individualistic approach. But that sort of dual arc technique is present in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, which demonstrates it to great effect. So let's look at the two arcs here. The plot level one has a personal component to it, of course. Akane is seeking redemption in the eyes of her colleagues for her role in the accident, by trying to defeat Godzilla. A well-done redemption story can be very compelling on its own, but not many of us have probably accidentally sent someone, multiple people even, to their deaths. We get it, and it makes sense, but it's not necessarily immediately relatable. 
the personal arc has to do with Akane's struggle with her own self-worth and regard for her own life. She never really goes into specifics about her past, but she mentions that she grew up without family or friends, and takes some degree of pride in having learned to simply bury her loneliness, abandoning the plant she cared for to cope with it when she was younger. She later admits she doesn't consider her life to have any value, and believes she probably shouldn't have been born. These are issues that started much earlier and run much deeper than her guilt over the accident. She's used to isolation, and has convinced herself that she deserves it, if she deserves to exist at all. This internal conflict doesn't necessarily prevent Akane from resolving the plot-related conflict, but consider what that victory would mean without resolving her own personal issues. It's possible she might redeem herself in the eyes of her fellow Kiryu team members, but she'd be more or less back where she started, alone, lacking in self-worth, and unable to form meaningful relationships with anyone else. In order for her victory to bring any significant change or genuine healing, she has to face her deep-seated problems with herself. Dr. Yuhara also occupies something of a secondary protagonist role. He's not as directly involved in the fight against Godzilla as Akane is, but his arc is central enough to the story that he can't really be considered just a supporting character either. While less Godzilla-centric, he also has somewhat of a dual arc, one that more clearly exemplifies the want-slash-need model for these types of stories. He wants to rebuild a complete family unit with Sarah by pursuing Akane romantically. In order for that to work, he needs to prove that he can be there for both of them. There's also Sarah's arc, which is simpler. She is still grieving over the loss of her mother. Sarah's mother was pregnant with a second child when complications arose, meaning only she or the child could survive. Dr. Yuhara preferred saving his wife. She wanted the child to survive. Sarah, only four at the time, wanted both to live, but neither did in the end. The incident left her highly sensitive about issues of life and death, with a strong conviction that all life has worth and is important, but serious emotional scars from being so harshly confronted with the impossibility of saving every life. She keeps a sleeping grass plant that she talks to as if it's her mother to cope with the loss. Akane's conflict would be compelling enough on its own, but the other two characters who play large roles in her arc also have fully conceived conflicts of their own. What's really impressive about the human element in this film, though, is the way that all of these arcs are interconnected, and each drives the others toward their respective resolutions. From the start, we see Yuhara trying to channel his grief constructively and move on from his wife's death. He couldn't save her, but now he tries to save endangered species through his research. He also is hesitant to take the government job developing Kiryu, which he fears would prevent him from being present enough in Sarah's life. She encourages him to take the job, but quickly becomes conflicted about its implications. This will come up again later. When Kiryu is complete and the team operating it is presented to its creators, Yuhara immediately becomes interested in Akane. His attempts to express this interest and initiate some kind of relationship, though, are consistently awkward and a little tone-deaf, as this may well be his first attempt at starting something new since he met his late wife. It's unlikely at this point that Akane would have been terribly receptive, even to the most tactful approach imaginable, but his opening line is... Or as rendered in the original DVD subtitles... He quickly realizes he's being way too blunt and backs off. Just then, Hayama shows up to give her shit, and there's an interesting and revealing interplay of the characters' personalities here. Akane says nothing in her own defense while Hayama insults her ability as a pilot. Then he works Yuhara into the routine and basically implies she's a slut, prompting Yuhara to attempt this dramatic chivalrous gesture of standing up for her. Hayama calls his bluff and shoves him, and only then, when Hayama attacks someone else, does Akane stop him? Afterwards, Akane explains the situation between her and Hayama to Dr. Yuhara and Sarah. Dr. Yuhara dwells a bit on having noticed the separation between her and the others, and Akane changes the subject, asking Sarah about her plant. Yuhara casually mentions the connection to Sarah's mother striking a nerve, then quickly apologizes. Akane opens up a bit about growing up alone, but Yuhara tries to steer things back to another awkward pass. Uh, 
お祝いに僕が食事をごちそうしようでもし桐生がゴジラに負けたら作った責任者としてお詫びに君を食事にご招待するってのどううん Akane doesn't really respond, but encourages Sarah to let go of the plant, as Akane did when she was younger. Godzilla reappears soon after, leading to a disastrous first confrontation in which Kiryu, whose DNA computer system incorporates the genes of the original Godzilla, has a flashback triggered by Godzilla's roar and becomes unresponsive to Akane's and the team's commands. Godzilla escapes and Kiryu goes on a destructive rampage in which Hayama is shot down and has to be rescued by Akane. Kiryu eventually runs out of power and repairs begin. Dr. Yuhara explains to Akane that they'll be replacing the genes used to operate the computers, then attempts a sort of chivalrous I'll do my best for you thing, which once again falls flat. Hayama comes around again, expressing disgust at the fact that he owes her his life. This time, the rest of the Kiryu team backs her up, and Hayama backs off. Meanwhile, Sarah has retreated to Kiryu's hangar, upset that Kiryu, now clearly a living thing with its own desires, is being subjected entirely to the will of humans and treated as a tool to fight a creature of its own kind, created by humans in the first place. Yuhara tries to calm her down, but his feigned understanding only upsets her more, and she runs off. Yuhara drops his usual facade and explains to Akane what happened with Sarah's mother and why Sarah is now so sensitive about life. Akane catches up to Sarah and tries to reassure her that nothing is wrong and that Kiryu's life, like her own, has no inherent worth or meaning. She's surprised when Sarah responds with genuine shock and concern that no life is worthless. Sarah's concern for her clearly strikes a chord and forces Akane to begin questioning her own assumptions. Godzilla reappears again, and after some deliberation about whether doing so is safe, the order is given to dispatch Kiryu. Sarah stops Akane on the way to her aircraft and silently extends her hand as if to ask her to take care of herself. Akane understands, shakes Sarah's hand, and hurries off. As Kiryu takes off to intercept Godzilla, Sarah's mood visibly lifts. After taking a particularly hard hit from Godzilla's atomic breath, Kiryu is knocked down and its remote control system damaged. Dr. Yuhara guides Akane as she takes control of Kiryu from the inside, and has all of Tokyo's power transmitted to Kiryu to replenish its internal power supply. Akane speaks to Kiryu as another living being with its own will, and brings it back to its feet, only for another blast of atomic breath to knock it down again, nearly knocking Akane out in the process. Semi-conscious, Akane sees the faces of the people depending on her, and draws strength from the realization that she is valued and her life does make a difference. She raises Kiryu up again, and just as Godzilla is about to fire his atomic breath a third time, Hayama draws its attention and blocks its mouth with his plane, telling Akane to use Kiryu's finisher, the Absolute Zero Cannon, and not to worry about him. Akane instead charges at and grabs Godzilla, removes Hayama from its mouth, and flies Kiryu out to sea with Godzilla crashing into the ocean and finally firing the cannon. Godzilla emerges from the ice still alive and begins to leave. Kiryu surfaces as well, out of commission but with Akane alive. The control room erupts in celebration of having successfully driven Godzilla away for the first time. Yuhara spots Sarah off to the side, overwhelmed and crying. He asks what's wrong, but she won't say. Instead of prying or trying to correct her, he simply sits beside her and puts an arm around her, comforting her as best he can. In a post credit scene, Dr. Yuhara and Sarah meet Akane back in Kiryu's hangar. Akane thanks them both for giving her strength, and tells Sarah that she was right noting that she's also not carrying the plant with her anymore. Dr. Yuhara mentions that, per his bet, he owes her dinner in celebration of her victory. She replies, As Yuhara and Sarah quietly celebrate, Akane turns and salutes Kiryu for its own efforts in the battle. The construction of these arcs is frankly phenomenal, building on the existential questions inherent in what amounts to a resurrected and enslaved monster as weapon, 
to create multiple deeply connected character arcs. Sarah forces Akane to realize the value of her own life as well as Kiryu's, giving her the strength to drive off Godzilla and allowing her to heal enough to let other people into her life. Yuhara fails a few times to really listen to or be genuine with Akane in his attempts at approaching her, and to adequately listen to and console Sarah, but comes through for both in the end, gaining him Akane's favor and strengthening his relationship with Sarah. Sarah, whose mother and younger sibling couldn't be saved, manages to save Akane, and thus is able to put her grief behind her. The way they all play into each other's healing leads to a life-affirming ending with strong themes of interdependence. It's one of the most excellent human stories in the entire Godzilla series. That still leaves the question for me of how it manages to work so much better than many of the films surrounding it, especially the other two directed by Masaki Tezuka. The screenplay was written by Wataru Mimura, who had a hand in a lot of Godzilla screenplays from the 90s and 2000s. He had a bit of a false start writing the frankly awful Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, the biggest saving grace of which was giving Miki Saigusa a degree of character development. After that, though, he co-wrote Godzilla 2000 with Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla screenwriter Hiroshi Kashiwabara. Space Godzilla had featured a greater emphasis on character drama and romance than its immediate predecessors, and that emphasis on character was somewhat apparent in 2000, which didn't have the emotional complexity of Against Mechagodzilla, but nonetheless featured a likable and interesting trio of protagonists, notably also a single father, his daughter, and a female lead brought into contact with them through work involving Godzilla. The two writers would go on to collaborate on Godzilla vs. Mechagirus, which featured many similar story elements to Against Mechagodzilla, but didn't work quite as well. I think the difference lies in the latter film being more focused all around, with a strong synthesis of character arcs, monster plot, and themes. Godzilla vs. Megagirus also features a female soldier who has a personal desire to defeat Godzilla as a result of the death of another soldier or soldiers. Both films also have a somewhat comedic technician with some degree of personal interest in the female soldier, and a child character that the female soldier shares a few scenes with. Both have the leads working on different parts of an effort to stop Godzilla using an advanced superweapon. In Megagirus, though, these elements all feel somewhat disparate and unconnected. The plot initially has to do with a plan to get rid of Godzilla using a black hole cannon fired from a satellite. The first test of the cannon opens a wormhole that allows mutated prehistoric insects to cross into this dimension and establish a colony, including the massive queen Megagirus. While the protagonists do respond to the appearance of these monsters, it still doesn't feel as if the Black Hole Cannon and Megagirus elements form one story, or even affect each other all that much. The human characters are mostly sidetracked by issues with the satellite during Godzilla's final battle with Megagirus, and once she's defeated, they carry on with their anti-Godzilla plan. Similarly, the scientist-slash-computer expert with a crush on the protagonist in Megagirus has no connection to the kid the protagonist talks to, and neither has any personal arc to speak of. The former still has his interest pretty much go unacknowledged until he's come through for her in some way during the final battle, but it's never quite resolved or addressed whether that interest is mutual or comes to anything in the end. The kid calls into question the protagonist's motivation for fighting Godzilla, albeit in different terms. <laughs> but this doesn't really go anywhere either, not that there's much to examine anyway. The protagonist's motivation in this one is simply avenging her commanding officer. There are a lot of loose ideas rattling around in Megagirus, but few of them are connected, and none of them have any depth to speak of. It's a very untidy script. Against Mechagodzilla improves on this by focusing a lot of Mechagirus' story elements on a theme derived from the premise, while also streamlining the story built from those elements. The rival monster and superweapon are combined into Kiryu, and previously unrelated subplots are all tied together. The result is much cleaner and allows for more of its subplots to actually be resolved. The sequel to Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, Godzilla Tokyo SOS, was written by neither Mimura nor Kashiwabara. 
Instead, the screenplay was written by director Masaki Tezuka and Masahiro Yokotani. Tezuka doesn't appear to have written anything before then. Yokotani's other credit in the Godzilla series is as one of three writers credited for Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack one of whom was that film's director, Shusuke Kaneko. It's pretty much impossible to draw any conclusions about Yokotani's writing from that, but his meager resume prior to Tokyo SOS suggests he was brought on so Tezuka would at least be working with somebody with some previous screenwriting experience. The result is extremely underwhelming in the character department. Overall, it feels like an attempt to repeat the formula that had worked on Godzilla against Mechagodzilla without really understanding it. There are some vague thematic elements regarding life and death that center on Kiryu, but they're mostly invoked by supporting characters. The Shobijin are the ones to bring them up, and Professor Chujo discusses it with the Prime Minister, but that's about as much as it affects the scene-to-scene -scene business of what the characters are doing. The protagonist is the Professor's nephew, Yoshito Chujo, a Kiryu mechanic. He has no arc. At most, he kinda shifts from seeing Kiryu as a military tool to seeing it as a being with its own will. But this isn't really front and center, and it's not really tied to anything personal for him at all. As much as his one scene with Akane rubs in how much worse he is as a character, I'm honestly glad her role in this one is so minimal. Considering how the new characters turned out, I think it's for the best that Tezuka and Yokotani didn't try to build on her arc in the sequel. If the theme in this one is really just going to be respect all life including Kiryu again, I'm glad they at least introduced a new character who has to learn what we all learned in the last movie, instead of undoing Akane's development. There's the hot-headed human antagonist, but he lacks Hayama's motivation and is kinda just an arrogant bastard. There's also Yoshito's nephew Shun, who summons Mothra. That's pretty much it. There's even sort of an attempt at a romantic subplot, but Yoshito's sort of love interest doesn't really have any kind of backstory, arc, or motivation. On top of that, this subplot is approached in the same kind of non-committal way as the subplot in Megaguirus. It's strongly implied, but barely explicitly addressed, if at all, and never really resolved. This sort of vagueness about the human characters seems to be an effort to avoid boring the audience with human complications when they're here to see monsters, but in the end it makes the film a great deal more boring by ensuring there's nothing interesting to connect with when the monsters aren't on screen. If the monster action weren't so fantastic, Tokyo SOS would probably sit right about even with the dullest of the Versus series. For completion's sake, Wataru Mimura did co-write the original screenplay for Godzilla Final Wars with then-series producer Shogo Tomiyama, but it was rewritten by director Ryuhei Kitamura and his frequent collaborator Isao Kiriyama, who reworked the story extensively to suit Kitamura's style and taste for martial arts action sequences. As such, it's difficult to evaluate or even describe Mimura's contribution to the script and story. Of course, the fact that the human story in this one is so great isn't down to the script alone. The cast deserve a great deal of credit as well. Child actors in kaiju films can be hit and miss, but Kana Onodera nails it as Sarah. Shin Takuma, who played Okamura in The Return of Godzilla, has a lot more to work with in the role of Dr. Yuhara, and he brings exactly the kind of good-natured nervousness the role needs. In the wrong hands, his repeated attempts to impress or flirt with Akane could have come off as irritating or creepy. Takuma manages to make him a likable, unimposing guy whose sporadic attempts at macho or chivalrous posturing are ill-fitting in a kind of endearing way. He's well-intentioned and reasonably self-aware about when he's being too blunt, and it makes all the difference. And of course, Yumiko Shaku turns in a great performance as Akane. Conveying complicated emotions while playing such a reserved and quiet character is a demanding task. What's especially impressive about how effectively Shaku pulls it off is that this is one of her first acting gigs. Akane is kind of an action hero, and yes, she's tough, she's competent, she's resilient, but she's also got some deep emotional conflicts underlying all of it, and Shaku is consistently credible no matter what a given scene calls for. It's also worth pointing out the tasteful handling of Akane's character in general, something that, depending on your perspective, either makes the film even better or makes it feminist poison and the worst thing to ever happen to the franchise. 
Before becoming an actress, Yumiko Shaku got her start in modeling and was most famous as a gravure idol. Gravure is a Japanese term for a type of swimsuit photography that's meant to be provocative or suggestive without being pornographic. It's named for the rotogravure printing process that was typically used by publications focusing on that kind of material. With that in mind, a sci-fi action movie with a star with Shaku's background doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, and not even because of the star's hypothetical acting ability or lack thereof. It wouldn't be unreasonable to expect the star to basically just be put on screen to look pretty, run around in a lot of revealing outfits, or generally just be used for a lot of fan service. but Godzilla against Mechagodzilla doesn't do that. Akane is a fully conceived and realized character with complex emotions and a well-executed arc, and is portrayed as capable and strong even while having serious issues to work through. The film treats her respectfully and her arc with absolute seriousness and sincerity, and I think approaching her character that way as opposed to the more obviously marketable, fan service base approach is something for which a great deal of credit is due to the writer and the director. Wait, what? Wait, but that, that stuff is... What the fuck? Okay, so maybe not the director specifically, and maybe not all of that was deliberate or really thought out, but it is nonetheless the way the movie is, and it's something I appreciate and that I think really helps make the human story in this film one of the series' best. And this isn't to say that characters throughout the franchise who aren't written in such intimate detail or whose arcs aren't so intricately tied to the monster story are bad, or that the movies they appear in are bad. I can't think of a single beat of substantial character development in Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, but it's still a classic, and its characters are still memorable and interesting. The characters in Godzilla King of the Monsters aren't exactly breaking new ground even for Godzilla films, let alone blockbuster sci-fi action films in general, but they serve their purpose, and overall I think the film works on a similar popcorn entertainment level to Roland Emmerich's Godzilla, only with a lot more love and respect for its source material. I don't bring up the example of Godzilla against Mechagodzilla to cast films like those in a negative light, but to point out that, yes, character and plot absolutely have a place in kaiju films, and yes, when done well, an engaging story can turn a decent kaiju film into something really special. Not every Godzilla film has to measure up to this one in terms of its human story, but to say that the human story doesn't or shouldn't matter does a disservice to this and many other wonderful films throughout the series and the genre's history. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. I know it's been a long time coming, and I really appreciate you guys' patience uh, for the last several months that I haven't been getting this one done. I'm really excited to finally share this video with you guys and find out what you think. Shout out to Exploder Button, my uh, first and only Patreon backer. G-Fest is coming up, and I will be there giving a panel with Michael Kalari, also known as Astounding Beyond Belief, about collecting the Godzilla series on home video. So yeah, as always, thanks a lot. Uh, check out my other social media accounts. I've got a Patreon if you want to support this and other projects I got in the works, and I'll see you guys next time.